Well, good evening. What an honor to be here with you and uh, honor to be with uh, FRC. I'm so thankful for the work of Tony Perkins and uh, Family Research Council and not just not just because of this particular moment, but because of all the years of accumulated credibility and work and uh, prayer and standing that has taken place. It's an honor to be with uh, all the other speakers here. Uh, Katie Faust, what, wasn't that moving? I'm just so thankful for her and thankful for that message. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm a Southern Baptist. I'm president not just of a Southern Baptist seminary, and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, okay? It's in the charter, it's in stone. Uh, we're, the, we're the mother seminary, and uh, I'm proud to be here at the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you just think of uh, the faithful preaching of Dr. Charles Stanley, so many decades here, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. One of my life goals has just been to be here, to be able to say just one time, now listen to me. <laughs> and uh, I just got to say it. <laughs> Couldn't say it just like he does, but when he says that, you listen to him. And uh, it's, uh, it's very important that we turn to God's Word. I want to, to do that tonight. I'm just thankful to be here with all of you, thankful to be with the other speakers. There's a summons here tonight, right? And we're, we're, not, we're not here because we just accidentally got into this room together. We, we were summoned here. There's something important happening that requires us to, uh, to pay heed and uh, to pray, yes, and to vote, and to stand. I want to direct us to a text of Scripture you know, although I'm, I'm going to suggest you probably don't know it as well as you think you know it. No insult intended. It's just because this is one of those passages that people know is there in Scripture, but don't know exactly what to do with it. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to, be, to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. You know, I think there are a lot of people who think that came from Hallmark. <laughs> it, it comes from Holy Scripture. It, it, it's in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. It comes in an historical context in, in terms of Solomon and, and it, advice to his son. It, it comes in the context of God's covenant with Israel. It's not just poetry. It, it's not just symmetry. It's not just parallelism, a time for this and a time for that. It's to make very clear that faithfulness for God's people depends upon knowing what time it is. That, that's just really crucial because even as this text comes to us, we better know if it's a time to gather or a time to cast away. We better know if it's a time uh, to break down or a time to build up. We better know if it's a time of peace or a time of war. Now, we're living in very strange times. I think you sense that. I, I think we all do. And, and I think we feel the urgency of it. And there's a sense in which all kinds of people are around us telling us that we're exaggerating the reality. And every once in a while, you know, you just need to listen to your opponents and wonder for a minute, well, am I? So let's think about this for a few moments. What's at stake? What, what's at stake? Well, what's at stake is unborn human life. What, what's at stake is human dignity and the sanctity of every single human life. What, what, what's at stake is the integrity of marriage as a part of God's creation order. And, and what's at stake is the integrity and the, the health of the family. And, and what's at stake is whether or not biological male means man and boy, biological female means girl and woman, or not. 
Now, you know this. You know that it, just the history of the 20th century, just secular history, you might say. Just, it, it, just, just look at the, the gathering clouds that became World War II and recognize the embarrassment was not upon those who said war is coming like Winston Churchill. The embarrassment was upon those who said, you're a radical extremist. And, and so standing where we stand right now, we recognize there's so much at stake. In one sense, we are at a time of war. And there are people who say, that's just irresponsible conversation. To that, I have to say, well, take that up with the Old Testament. Take that up with God. In 1973, the Roe v. Wade decision was handed down by the Supreme Court of the United States. I was uh, 14 years old uh, that year. Uh, my mother became very active in the pro-life movement very quickly. And uh, I learned a lot very fast. It was a shock. It was a shock to the entire nation. It was certainly a shock to conservative Christians. How, how could this happen? How could the Supreme Court of the United States somehow just invent a, a woman's so-called right to abortion, which means, after all, the, the intentional killing of the unborn child within her? How can that just be? And remember one of the arguments made, and again, the conservative Christians just couldn't even believe these arguments were being made. One of the arguments made in the oral arguments in the Roe v. Wade decision was that in order for a woman to be equal with a man, she had to be equally able to be unpregnant at any moment. That was one of the arguments. That, that, that is still one of the arguments that the pro-abortion movement uses. The shock of Roe v. Wade, I just want to remind you, led to Christians in this country and others concerned for the sanctity of human life, but mainly Christians. We need to be very clear about that. The pro-life movement has been overwhelmingly Christian due to the historic Christian teachings concerning the fact that every single human life from the moment of fertilization until natural death is God's image on earth. The, the Christian tradition is what the Christian truth claim, the Christian gospel is what produced the pro-life movement as we know it. But I just want to remind you as we're gathered together tonight that the pro-life movement worked for nearly half a century before just a matter of weeks ago in June of this year, at the very end of this month, the Supreme Court of the United States reversed Roe v. Wade. And I just want to remind you, a half century is a very long time. And, and I want to remind you that when the, the, the Roe v. Wade decision was handed down, conservative Christians thought, there's no way we can mount some kind of challenge. This is, after all, a 7-2 decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. And immediately, because of God's gift of law, when the law is corrupt, the, the law begins to teach corruptly. And so the, the, the American people began to say, we're just moving on. You know, just, just uh, you know, problem what problem? Just, just, just move on. And there were Christians who said, no, we can't move on. But I just want to remind you very quickly that the movement, the pro-life movement, spent untold years in the wilderness without a single success. I was interviewed on this issue just recently and, uh, from a national reporter, and the reporter said, well, you know, uh, when did pro-lifers know you were winning? I said, well, number one, we're not there yet. Uh, but, but, but number two, throughout most of the history of the pro-life movement of the last 50 years, the left was sure we were losing, and we weren't sure they were wrong. State by state, legislature after legislature, and then, and then, and then case after case, I can still remember because I was, uh, I, I, I was very much uh, active in these issues already as a young man. Just a year before I was elected president of Southern Seminary, I've been there, now there, this is my 30th year. Just the year before, the Supreme Court handed down the Casey decision, and that, that appeared to be the great opportunity for the reversal of Roe v. Wade, because after all, Ronald Reagan had been elected president in 1980, you know, seven years after Roe v. Wade, and, and there was a process, and, and conservative presidents have been naming more conservative justices, and it turned out not to matter enough yet. It turned out, for one thing, conservatives didn't know how to find a conservative justice. It took a while to figure that out. But you know what? It, there were, there, the Casey decision was handed down, and, and it was a devastating loss, just a devastating loss. But there, there was one little glimmer of hope in it, because it, it did modify Roe to the extent that it was clear states could move in a, a bit more proactively on behalf of the unborn. And states began to do it. And look, this was fits and starts, and every one of those bills was, a, was and is a fight. 
and, uh, and every one of them was, was basically a matter of litigation because the pro-abortion movement would just say, well, you know, okay, you can win in the state capitol, but we're going to win in the federal courts. And they did sometimes. It was sometimes like two steps forward and <laughs> five steps back. And look, I have to tell you, one of the great litmus tests, if you want to know where someone is in terms of the big issues of life, just find out if they celebrated the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Because that right there is a test of the heart, and that's a test of the testimony right there. But it is also true that the reversal of Roe v. Wade has merely bought us the opportunity for the bigger war on behalf of of the dignity and sanctity of life, which is to say, it's very hard to say to our kids, you know, we've been working at this for 50 years, 50 years, just, just, just short of 50 years to the reversal of Roe v. Wade. And, 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 and here's the good news. Here's the good news. We got 50 more years of work to do. You know, when I stand in a room like this, you know what I think? I think I just wish I had the opportunity to tell so many wonderful believers and faithful Christians now dead that Roe v. Wade was reversed because they worked in the trenches. <laughs> they, they received the, the, the treatment, the ill treatment of the world. Uh, they stood in lines. They held signs. They, they, they stood in prayer circles. They witnessed to women going into abortion clinics. And, and many of them are now with the Lord. They never got to see this. But I raise this tonight because I want to tell you the big battles are still to come. It's sobering to recognize that as important as these battles were, every single one of them important, and every single one of them required Christians to vote right, rightly, and to stand bravely. See, we're the people who know two things, and we just say this to each other, and we got to say them both at the same time, okay? And that is, every single election matters. But every single election is followed by the next one. And faithfulness now is absolutely necessary. And frankly, just given the temporality of life, we've got to give primary attention to faithfulness right now. 2022 in the United States means votes matter. Amen. And we have a responsibility to make certain that Christians understand the stewardship of the vote, which means the discipleship of the vote, which means the urgency of the vote, the treasure of the vote. And they need to understand that insofar as they do not vote or they vote wrongly, they are unfaithful because the vote is a powerful stewardship. And we need to remind Christians of that. We need to remind Christians of what's at stake. Uh, so a lot of Christians are going to say, hey, Roe v. Wade was reversed, so all the pressure's off. Well, welcome to the state of Georgia. Welcome to the state of Georgia. I spent four years as editor of the Baptist newspaper here in Georgia, the Christian Index, and uh, I was honored to be among Baptists. I preached in just about every county in the state of Georgia. So when I found out, you got a lot of them. I have uh, been all over the state. My office, uh, when I was editor of the Christian Index, just a matter of a, a few miles from here on Chambly Tucker Road. And, uh, you know, at that time, everyone would have thought of Georgia as a conservative state. And over a period of time, Georgia has appeared to get more conservative. You know, we got red and blue America. Georgia has turned to get redder and redder and redder. Brothers and sisters, something happened. And I'm here not because I primarily am concerned about an electoral map. That's not the ultimate issue. What I'm concerned about is the life of the unborn. And what I'm concerned about is the sanctity of marriage. And, and here's, here's the issue, and here's another pattern. I just hope Christians think about this. And, and you need to think about this, and you need to talk about this out loud. We're going to be disappointed. And that just should make us redouble the effort, triple the effort, triple our commitment. Just reminds us of how important the battle is and how we've got to lean into it. Forty-seven Republicans voted for the so-called Respect for Marriage Act. By the way, that is one of the most Orwellian things I've ever heard. Destroy marriage and call it the Respect for Marriage Act. That is just the way Washington does it. It's like the Balance the Budget Act. That mm, You know how that works. Uh, only this one has life and death hanging in the balance and the integrity of marriage hanging in the balance and the lives and futures of children hanging in the balance. And 
47 Republicans in the House voted for it. You want to know why? Because there are a lot of Republicans that want to get past this issue. They just, they, 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 they want to say, okay, you know, they, uh, there was a car accident, but it's cleared and the roads are clear. So just move on. Just, just, just move on. And, and uh, as Tony mentioned that Chuck Schumer's announced he's going to bring it up for a vote. He's bringing it up for a vote because he figures that he can't lose either way. Okay. So let's just talk about how politics works. He thinks he can't lose either way because either he gets what he wants, which is the, the enough Republicans to vote with the Democrats to get the Respect for Marriage Act, which after all would codify the Obergefell decision. Basically, just to enforce same-sex marriage coast to coast. And by the way, because they were stupid enough in writing this bill, they simply said that every state must recognize what's a legal marriage in every other state. That meant that Massachusetts, that already has some cities legalizing polygamy, a state like that could actually legalize polygamy and all 50 states would have to recognize marriage. And they say, well, they fixed that. And don't you love it when the Senate fixes things? <laughs> if only. And they're telling us, don't worry about religious liberty. Don't worry about religious liberty. Even as, even as you know, the, the, they move in on, and it's not just conservative Christians, they moved in on Orthodox Judaism and Yeshiva University saying that the school isn't Jewish enough. It's Yeshiva University and it's not Jewish enough. Male students have to study the Torah one to five hours a day. Hey, but a, a state judge in New York said, no, you have to have an LGBTQ student group officially recognized because in the view of the state of New York, you're not Jewish enough to be a Jewish institution. Well, they can do that to Yeshiva University. They can do it to your Christian school. It's just a reminder of what's at stake. And they tell us, oh, we fixed the religious liberty things. And by the way, the people I worry about the most who tell me they fixed the religious liberty things, the, 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 the religious liberty concerns are, are taken care of. The people who concern me there are the Republicans who are trying to justify voting for this atrocity. But we just need to understand when you look at this and, and you just think about the, 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 uh, the so-called Respect for Marriage Act. The Obergefell decision was handed down in 2015. Roe v. Wade was handed down in 1973. It took 50 years to reverse Roe v. Wade and all that meant, and it was essential and it's wonderful, and you should measure people by whether or not they will willingly and eagerly rejoice in the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But we have a 50-state battle now. Kansas, just a few weeks ago, just reminded us it's a 50-state battle. Even states we thought were pro-life, we've got to hold their feet to the fire. As I told my listeners just the other day, when it comes to things like the Respect for Marriage Act, we got to take names. And we got to remember those names. But it also just points to the importance of every election. Because... We've got to elect members of Congress, senators, governors, state legislators, you just go down the list. But most particularly, as we're thinking right now about electing governors, electing members of Congress, electing senators, and then looking at those crucial state legislative battles, we understand it matters massively who is sitting under the dome there in Georgia's capital in Atlanta. It matters massively who is sitting in the United States Capitol, in the House of Representatives, and in the Senate. It matters massively who's sitting behind the Oval Office in the White House. We have to keep this in mind every single election. And by the way, one of the problems in midterm elections is there's so many people who, who are, are right on the issues, at least I think they would vote if they got into the voting booth. They, they would vote correctly. They say this is only a midterm election. I just want you to understand that these midterm elections determine in so many ways not only what will happen in terms of the next Congress and the House and then the Senate as you think about uh, the national offices and, and, and not only what happens in terms of several governorships and, and other statewide elections that, that are open. It is a setup for the national election that, that comes in 2024. And I just have to tell you, I'm, I'm speaking, I know many of you are not from Georgia, but I know a lot of you are here from Georgia. I just want to tell you, the whole nation will be looking to Georgia. And we need Georgia to send a very certain sound. We just need to remind ourselves continually of what time it is. You know, sometimes it's a time for peace and a time of war at the same time. This is what Christians understand. It depends upon what context you reference. I certainly hope that in your marriage, it's a time of peace, not a time of war. In fact, you're sitting together closely tells me we're in good shape there. 
I hope in your family it's a time of peace, not a time of war. I hope in your church it's a time of peace and not a time of war. But brothers and sisters, you look at the world around us, it's a time of war, not a time of peace. There are those who will come promising peace, but they will promise peace at the expense of truth. They'll promise peace at the expense of, at the expense of life. They'll promise peace at the expense of marriage. And, and understand, it's just if you're wondering if it really is a time for war, if you, if you really do wonder just recognize that we are living in a time in which we are shown a male body in a woman's bathing suit on a championship intercollegiate swim team, a women's team, and we are told that's a woman, deal with it. And we're told that when it comes to little children, that they should be allowed to declare themselves non-binary. And the rest of the society must simply conform to a boy claiming to be a girl and a girl claiming to be a boy. And by the way, the world, the world insists that that is love. And you know, one of the hardest things for Christians, but necessary things for Christians, is for us to recognize that truth and love are the same thing. Jesus, yes. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, we're told the, world, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, that's the perfect, eternal, incarnate Christ, full of grace and truth. Never grace at the expense of truth, but grace and truth, because he is grace and he is truth. We who are his disciples must also demonstrate lives of grace and truth. We have no right to accept a secular, godless understanding of grace and love that says, I have the right to tell you who I am in terms of my gender, all the rest. It isn't that we want to be the people who kill their joy. We're the people who want them to know the joy of Christ. You know, I think often of the New Testament promise of our resurrection bodies. And it strikes me, and I'm writing about this now, and uh, it has really affected my heart. It strikes me that when Christians when we speak of and preach about the resurrected body, it's a perfected, glorified body. I want to ask you a question. Is there any chance, do you think there's any chance whatsoever that our glorified bodies are the contradiction of the bodies in which God created us in this life? I don't think so. What we want for people is for them to know greater joy. And that means we need righteous laws in terms of this life and the joy in this life and, 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 and human flourishing in this life. We need righteous laws. We need righteous judges. We need, we, we need what in this constitutional project voters get to vote upon. We need the right voters showing up with the right convictions at the right time to vote the right way in order that our children and our children's children may inherit this grand constitutional experiment, which I believe under the providence of God is unprecedented in human history. And to us, we as Christians know it's given to us not just as a project, but as a stewardship. Ultimately, our citizenship is in heaven. And that's why our first and foremost concern is to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that sinners hearing the gospel may, may believe and believing may be saved but it's also our Christian responsibility to make this world, by every bit of influence that we have, more fit for the living and for those who will yet in generations to come. Should Jesus tarry, live. It's difficult to summarize all that is required of us, but at the very least, at the very least, you know that three words really do matter. Pray, vote, stand. Proud to do so with you. May God bless us all. Good night. Freedom's coming.